This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. Among the most anticipated and most enthusiastically reviewed novels of the year is Don DeLillo's new book, Underworld. DeLillo has been called the chief shaman of the paranoid school of American fiction. That's perhaps best exemplified by his novel Libra, a fictionalized version of Lee Harvey Oswald's life. The new novel, Underworld, begins on a day in 1951 framed by two events, the Giants winning the pennant with a surprise home run and the Soviets testing the atom bomb. In a New Yorker article about DeLillo, David Remnick wrote, Many of DeLillo's old themes are in Underworld, the increasing power of the image and the media in the modern world, the uncertainty of American life after the Kennedy assassination, a sense of national danger, men and women who live outside the mainstream of ordinary life and language. But more often, Underworld is a darkly funny satire of post-war language, manner, and obsessions. I asked DeLillo why he chose the baseball game and Adam Bomb Test to frame his new novel. He told me he was checking out the baseball game in an edition of the New York Times from October 4th, 1951, and he found the story of the bomb test. It struck me with the force of revelation. Uh, on the front page of the Times, there was um, a headline on the left about this um, legendary, what is now a legendary ball game, um, Giants Capture Pennant and so on. And on the right side of the front page, symmetrically matched uh, three columns, a three-line headline, the same typeface, Soviets explode atomic bomb. Something about the juxtaposition of these two events made me think there was something here I wanted to explore. I wasn't sure at the moment quite what. What I did feel was a sense of the power of history. And through the five years it took me to write the book, it began to occur to me slowly that in fact there is a kind of relationship between this ball game, this particular ball game, and that um, atomic test uh, on the other side of the world. And what do you and think the relationship I, is? Well, I think that the ball game was um, a unifying and largely joyous event, the kind of event in which people come out of their houses in order to share their feelings with others, and an event not primarily defined by television. There was only uh, limited coverage. With the onset of the bomb, the communal spirit becomes associated with danger and loss rather than with celebration. And the sense of catastrophic events framed and defined by TV grows ever stronger. Assassinations, terrorist acts, even natural disasters. In my private little history text, uh, this ball game marks a kind of transitional moment between the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. You've said that, that murders actually draw us together. You know, you're talking about the crowd either being a crowd expressing its joy or coming together because of catastrophe. You've said murders draw us together. They draw people together in ways that only the most disastrous contemporary events can match. We depend on disaster con to consolidate our vision. And there's a, um, a murder that is captured on videotape and is shown over and over and over again on television in your new book. And it's a murder by the Texas highway killer who's a sniper who shoots at motorists driving by. And this is accidentally captured on tape by a girl with a video camera. Um, I'd like you to do a, a reading from a passage about this. This is from your new book, Underworld. Feel free to introduce it for us before you read. The videotape is uh, is a curious contemporary phenomenon, um, and it is marked uh, in a way by um, by repetition. Such tapes always seem to be characterized by uh, violence or tragedy, and I, I've begun to get the idea that that this endless repetition, uh, the reshowing day after day of a particular tape, 
until its power dwindles and another tape uh, replaces it, I begin to think that this, this is almost our last, um, our last perception of nature. That is, the violence we see on these tapes is not choreographed movie violence. It is violence in its natural state, caught in some cases accidentally, casually. And so it has a kind of mm. base reality. It is real, it is taped, and it is shown repeatedly. Maybe you could do the reading now. It shows something awful and unaccompanied. You want your wife to see it because it is real this time, not fancy movie violence. The realness beneath the layers of cosmetic perception. Hurry up, Janet. Here it comes. He dies so fast. There is no accompaniment of any kind. It is very strict. You want to tell her it is realer than real, but then she will ask what that means. The way the camera reacts to the gunshot, a startled reaction that brings pity and terror into the frame, the girl's own shock, the girl's identification with the victim. You don't see the blood, which is probably trickling behind his ear and down the back of his neck. The way his head is twisted away from the door, the twist of the head gives you only a partial profile, and it's the wrong side. It's not the side where he was hit. And maybe you're being a little aggressive here, practically forcing your wife to watch. Why? What are you telling her? Are you making a little statement? Like I'm going to ruin your day out of ordinary spite? Or a big statement? Like this is the risk of existing? Either way, you're rubbing her face in this tape and you don't know why. It shows the car drifting toward the guardrail. And then there's a jostling sense of two other lanes and part of another car, a split-second blur, and the tape ends here, either because the girl stopped shooting or because some central authority, the police or the district attorney or the TV station, decided there was nothing else you had to see. This is either the 10th or 11th homicide committed by the Texas Highway Killer. The number is uncertain because the police believe that one of the shootings may have been a copycat crime. And there is something about videotape, isn't there, and this particular kind of serial crime. This is a crime designed for random taping and immediate playing. You sit there and wonder if this kind of crime became more possible when the means of taping an event and playing it immediately, without a neutral interval, a balancing space and time, became widely available. Taping and playing intensifies and compresses the event. It dangles a need to do it again. You sit there thinking that the serial murder has found its medium, or vice versa, an act of shadow technology, of compressed time and repeated images, stark and glary and unremarkable. That's Don DeLillo reading from his new novel, Underworld. I think it's a kind of interesting coincidence that it, this comes out right after the death of Princess Diana in the auto accident when America just watched over and over and over again the same video footage of the um, total the totaled car in the tunnel. Um, and it seemed to like hold everybody together watching it over and over again. I, um, I'd, I'd rather not uh, say too much about that particular tragedy because just about everything has been said but it it is curious that it was um, an event not just overproduced and over orchestrated by the subsequent media coverage but an event as some people think partly caused by the media and in a, a terrible and grotesque way this makes it um, perfect for our time. Mm. 